Reclamation is defined as the act or process of reclaiming a restoration as to productivity, usefulness, or morality. That's the definition of reclamation. Ms. Jessup White has heard stories about starting with her being related to Thomas Jefferson when she was a young girl. And her curiosity and chosen profession of journalism led her to a lifelong journey of research and discovery. Ms. Jessup White searched for 40 years to find the answers and truth about her family legacy. That is real perseverance, and I'm sure she'll tell us all about that when she comes to talk to us. This book chronicles the journey Ms. Jessup White took to find her heritage and discover a story of black heritage. After reading Reclamation, I wanted to learn more about Ms. Jessup White. During one interview, she talked about finding her history. She talked about her family and finding her wholeness. I hope she, she expands on that when she comes and talks to us. I thought that was really wonderful that she said that. You know, pe people want to be made whole. They want to feel whole. They want to feel that they matter. And, and let's, let's have her talk about that to us. Um, Ms. Jessa White found through DNA that she was the descendant of Thomas Jefferson on her father's side. Her, she said her favorite president, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you said that was your favorite president. And also, her, she was the great-great-granddaughter of Peter Hemings, Sally Hemings' brother. It's no wonder that Ms. Jessup White was named a Jefferson Studies Fellow. She is now the Public Relations and Community Engagement Officer at Monticello. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce to you and ask her, well, she's not going to come to the day, she's going to have a discussion right there, but I want to introduce to you and welcome Ms. Gail Jessup White to tell us more about reclamation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Um, and my name is Paula Whitaker. I have the honor of talking to Gail today. I read her book. We've talked a few times beforehand. Um, just to get, we want to go a little bit further behind both the content and the process of how she came from um, investigating her family history to actually writing this book. Um, so I want to start, I think, today with um, the title, which is very evocative. Um, as was as was defined, and how you came to choose it, and why reclamation means so much to you. I'm happy to answer those questions. Thank you, Paula. Before we jump into that, I want to thank you first of all. I want to thank Danny for that introduction, and I really want to thank all of you for being here in this heat. It is hot outside, <laughs> so I really appreciate you being here. So, to your question, what does reclamation mean to me? And to Danny's comment as well, reclamation means finding that history, claiming that history, claiming that past, claiming what my ancestors did to help build this country, what black people helped to do to build this country, finding my family and becoming whole as a result of it. So many black people don't know, we don't know our history. We were robbed of that. We were robbed of everything. We were robbed of our own personhood. And we feel that. We can't go back, most of us, beyond that 1870 census. Can everybody hear me OK, by the way? Good. The 1870 census, when people who were considered property finally became human and were counted. We can't go beyond that. And I always felt that. I always felt that something was missing. So in finding this history and understanding who my people were and seeing myself in them and knowing that without them, I wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here, frankly, I found myself, I found a voice that I've been missing my entire life. So we can speak in really abstract terms about what reclamation means to me. In many ways, it means salvation. This book saved me. It saved a life that was kind of vacuous, quite frankly, that became whole and became full and allowed me to speak for people who did not have a voice. It sounds like a cliche, but it's true. A people whose voice, voices were smothered 
whose voices were ignored, whose descendants' voices were ignored, whose descendants continue to fight to be heard. Reclamation is the continuation of that fight, the embrace of that fight, and claiming this history as ours. And it really was sort of a, um, a series of almost coincidences, coincidences like lead you to start the search, right? There was this comment from an aunt who you never knew because you, you were much younger, but maybe right. just explain a little bit about how it went from kind of, you know, a, this might be possible, this is sort of a family story to, I've got to find out more. So I'll give you a little background. I'm from Washington, D.C., went to Howard University. Any Howard grads out here? So, all right. <laughs> H.U., you know. <laughs> so I love Washington. It's my hometown. I live in Richmond, Virginia, but I'll always be a Washington, D.C. girl. Love the place. Growing up in D.C., when I grew up many, many years ago, Washington was majority black. I grew up middle class with a very solid id. My dad, as many black people in this country, particularly in D.C., um, worked for the federal government. My dad started out as a mailman. He started as a mailman. He went to Howard as well. But he moved up. By the time I came along, the youngest of five children, he was an executive in the post office. So we were living really well. By, by American standards, we were living really well. If you live well by American standards, you're living well by world standards. I wanted for nothing. I write about this in the book because even though I want it for nothing, my story becomes very complicated by the time I was 13 years old, including discovering tension in my household between my parents, including discovering racism, which I hadn't existed, had, didn't know existed, frankly, and including discovering that I was descended from Thomas Jefferson. And here's how I found out to answer your question. My oldest sister, Janice Terry, is close to 20 years older than I. We're all born in July, my sisters and I. My sister had been living in Singapore. She accompanied her husband, who was a correspondent for Time magazine. He was covering the Vietnam War, so it's some time ago. And they were the guests of honor at the American Embassy in Saigon. They'd come back home after being away for two years and after a year in Boston, in Cambridge, actually, where my brother-in-law was a Neiman Fellow. My sister was visiting. My sister's so beautiful. And when I was 13, I was clumsy and funny looking and had funny hair and <laughs> all those things that 13 year olds have. <laughs> so here comes beautiful Janice Terry, long, lean, glamorous in every respect, and talking a mile a minute. I get kind of bored with the conversation. She's talking to my dad. My mother also got bored with it. She's left the room. I'm in the kitchen grabbing a snack and I hear my sister say, and I said, we're descended from Thomas Jefferson. Well, that got my attention. And the background, which I, I left ahead and told you the background, the background of that story is that she and her husband were at the American Embassy in Saigon. They were the guests of honor at a small dinner party. And at this dinner party, people, they were the only blacks there, she and her husband. Everyone else at the dinner party was white, and they were discussing their lineage with great pride, as if they were descended from royalty to which my sister takes great umbrage, because we're Americans. We fought to separate ourselves from the monarchy, and they were bragging, and she didn't like it. So she looks at her husband. This is another era when women defer to their husbands. I can't imagine my sister deferring, but she deferred to him at this moment. And he gives her a nod, because he knows what's coming. <laughs> and my beautiful, elegant sister with a swan-like neck, raises to her greatest height, and she says to the audience, to the dinner party, well, I'm descendant from Thomas Jefferson. And she said the room went dead silent. <laughs> it was taboo to have such a conversation back then. You didn't talk about that sort of thing. I think, when was, um, when was the Loving case? Was that in 67? 67. Yeah. So this is around the time of the Loving case when what we used to call miscegenation was finally outlawed or not made illegal put it to you like that. So the room was shocked, and I was shocked when I heard this story. So I kept going to my dad. My dad was the silent type. But I thought there might be something to this story. I had my doubts, but I, I mean, I'm a black kid growing up in DC. How could I be descended from Thomas Jefferson? I wasn't taught that Jefferson owned people. He was at that point my favorite president. He is no longer for a couple of reasons. 
only in peoples among them. The other was um, Barack Obama, but. <laughs> so I go to my dad. My dad is 6'2", has freckles, had red hair in his youth, and has this aquiline nose, save a slope going down the, um, what do you call this part of the nose? This is what happens when you're almost 65, the bridge, thank you. So I'm thinking there must be something to this story because my favorite president at the time was 6'2", had freckles and red hair. As it turns out, Daddy finally confides to me that his mother was from Charlottesville. When he tells me this, and it took me a long time to get this information from my dad, when he tells me this, I go, Daddy, Jefferson was from Charlottesville. And Dad, in his way, says, I know. And it goes on from there. My dad did not like to talk about his history. There are many reasons why. They're complex. I've written about them. But one of them is because my dad knew the reason he looked as he did, a light-skinned man with red hair, was because someone in his family, a woman in his family, had been compromised. She'd either been raped, forced into a relationship she didn't want, a relationship that wasn't accepted, socially acceptable. Any of those things was difficult for him to accept. He didn't want to talk about it. But I was his favorite. <laughs> Hope nobody's recording this. I don't want my sisters to know that. You were the youngest, too. You could give youngest. yourself some right. And he, he, was, he and I had a special bond. I write about that as well. And eventually, he started sharing so much of his life with me. And part of what he shared, and what I also learned from my sister, to answer your question, was that this story came down from a woman named Aunt Peachy. I never knew Aunt Peachy. She was gone by the time I was aware of my own life. She died when I was a couple of years old. And Aunt Peachy always said to my sister, my oldest sister, the very glamorous one, you're descended from Thomas Jefferson. I'm not, but you are. I finally extracted from my dad that Aunt Peachy was his mother's half-sister. It was his mother who was descended from Jefferson. Aunt Peachy was not, but she was, pr was proud that her sister was descended from Thomas Jefferson, so proud that she insisted on sharing that information with my sister. My sister shared it with a doubting group of people at the American Embassy in Saigon, and my 13-year-old ears perked up when I heard her sharing that story with my dad, and let's move ahead several decades, here we are. So there you go. Yeah, but in the beginning, could you keep up with that? Was that okay? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> but in the meantime, there's not ancestry.com. Right. There's not all the sort of tools that we, and not to mention all the work that had already that since been done on the Hemings family. Yes. And so it took a lot of time and detective work and you know perseverance on the part of you and Jan right. to start tracking things. I mean. You know, because you got to go from a family story to authentication. To, That's right. right. So, That's right. Um, it did take time. Yeah. So I'm going to get a little, um, it's not, I don't want to call it spiritual, but there's some, some spirituality involved in this. I really believe that my ancestors called me to tell this story. I live in Richmond, Virginia, as I mentioned. I'm a total D.C. girl. Richmond, Virginia was nowhere on my radar. But I fell in love with a man, his name's Jack White. He wrote for Time Magazine, as my brother-in-law did. And he moved to Richmond to teach at Hampton. And I was gonna go anywhere where Jack was going. So we ended up in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond is about an hour's drive from Charlottesville. And as a result of being that close to Monticello, I started visiting on a regular basis. And as a result of visiting on a regular basis, I finally got the attention of the people at Monticello. I had no business and have no business being in Richmond, Virginia. For all, so many visits at Monticello, no one paid attention to me at all. I'm finally there with my son, my tall, handsome son, MIT graduate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and at that time, it was an odd day. We hadn't planned on going there at all. At that time, someone finally pays attention to me when I raise my hand and say, I'm, the descendant, I'm a descendant from Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hammonds, which I did every time I visited Monticello. So all these coincidences are occurring, all these things that seem to be coincidences. But to me, they are not. For me, there were my ancestors calling me back. For me, there were people saying, we have to be heard. We are a part of American history. And you have a voice, and you have a talent. And my talent was just okay. I mean, I could write. I could write a news story. 
But the ancestors gave me the talent to write this book. When I read this book, I was telling Paula earlier, I can't believe I wrote this book. <laughs> they did it. They inspired me to do this. So there are no coincidences that brought you here today in all this heat. There's something that you want from this. You're going to walk away from this inspired to do something, to tell a story, to find your own story, to do your own discovery. Because you're brought here for a reason, for a reason. And my ancestors brought me here, and I know it. I don't have any doubt about it. So there's your answer to the yeah. coincidences. So um, maybe talk a little bit about um, you know, the, the process of, you know, because it's not just about um, you know, the search for your ancestors. It's also a search inside yourself, yes. thinking about your family and, and your own kind of growing up. And right. you know, lots of folks out here, um, this might be one reason why you should write biographies and not memoir, but um, are wanting to go into their own past for, you know, memoir, essay, and yeah. maybe just talk a little bit about kind of what that process was all about. I will. Now, I, I looked at my watch because I don't want to talk too long because I'm hoping that you have questions. So you'll stop me, yeah. please. Mm -hmm. when, yep. And if I go on too long, please yep. stop yep. me. Everyone has a story, right? Everyone has something to say. Everyone has a history. Every single one of us has value. I didn't know what my value was. This is very difficult for me to admit, but I was kind of a shallow person. I liked pretty things, still do. I grew up in a very insular world. I cared about living in fancy houses and going to parties and being sociable and shopping. I like to read, I always like to read. So there was always this other side of me that was in competition with the glamour girl part of me. But something happened. Actually, my husband, my current husband kind of did it. He's so smart. And I really had to live up to his expectations. I could not be married to this smart man <laughs> and continue on the path I was on. And then I had this calling. And this calling for me has been like a spiritual calling, like if they're uh, a religious calling. I've heard that people who preach have a calling. Well, th that's what this has been for me. And it's changed my life. And it came me, changed me from being from that girl who was, from a girl, a girl, I mean, I'm talking in my 40s and still calling myself a girl, into a woman who cares, who's not afraid to speak up, who calls racism out when she sees it. I did not want to give attention to racism when I was growing up. I didn't want to know it existed. Even though I had been exposed to it when I was 13, I dismissed it until a few years ago when I remembered what happened in Las, Las Vegas at a hotel when I was 13 when a little girl I befriended wasn't allowed to play with me anymore. I put that way back in the recesses of my mind. But in my 50s, all of these things came back to me. And I am so proud proud to have the strength and the will and the voice and the platform to speak without fear about the world in which we live and what we must do to change it. And this book did that for me. This discovery did that for me. The ancestors did that for me. So yes, it's been a growing process. And I am so proud. <laughs> I mentioned my age. I used to lie about my age. Regularly, I always shave 10 years off. Well, I'm proud to say I'll be 65 years old in July. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It took me a lifetime to get to this point, but doggone it, I made it. I made it, and I'm proud of that. And the, the, the book writing part, I mean, it's a lifetime yeah. that's in the book. Yeah. The actual writing of the book, like, you know, roughly how long um, was that for you? So. The uncovering of the history literally took 45 years. I started collecting stories first from my dad and then from my sister Janice. My other siblings didn't know too much about it. Most of my dad's family was dead, so there was no one to get this information from. My uncle was still alive. I collected some um, family artifacts along the way. Finally ended up at, um, in Virginia, as I mentioned earlier, and finally ended up at Monticello uh, as a fellow, and that would have been in 2014, 2014. A tragedy struck our family in 2014. Um, my husband, my first husband, 
from whom I was divorced at the time, died. And he died the week my son graduated from college, a few days before. So it was horrific. It was horrific, especially for, especially for my son. Um, I thought that the worst days of my life were when my parents died. But no, the worst day of my life was when my ex-husband died because my son suffered. So it was a horrible thing to go through. That's the human part of the story and experiences that we all have feeling pain. And I was saved once again, saved once again, by um, becoming a fellow at Monticello the same summer my ex-husband died. And so that was 2014. In 2016, two years later, I lobbied for a job at Monticello. I never wanted anything more than to have that job at Monticello. So I lobbied for that job. I started there in 2016. Um, and then I started taking notes at my sister's encouragement. She says, Gail, write everything down. So I'm a former journalist, so I write everything down anyway. I have done that since I was 12. So I wrote, wrote everything down, and uh, actually an agent came to me and said, I think you've got a story. And I said, I think I do too. So here we are. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, it's interesting that you are actually working there. I do. Now. Yeah, so maybe talk a little bit about working there, <laughs> being of there, you know, watching what's yeah. going on there. Yeah. yeah, so I'm smiling because when you work at a place and you love the place, and then you write a book and you criticize the place, you wonder if you're gonna keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> but my employer was very gracious about this. The president of Monticello actually introduced me when the book was launched, and she said so graciously, we learned a lot. We learned about improvements we can make. And Monticello's constantly making improvements. When you visit Monticello, how many of you have been recently? Yay, that's great. So you've seen the exhibition, The Life of Sally Hemings, which is an extraordinary exhibition because it really speaks to the truth, which we've been doing at Monticello for a long time, but <laughs> more of the truth all the time. Seems like a gradual thing, but it's happening. So for me, it's been restorative to work at a place like that. It's also been challenging because there are very few people like me who work there, who look like me who work there. Um, culturally, it's um, quite different than anything I've been exposed to before, short of when I worked at the New York Times, when I was so intimidated by the smart people around me. There's smart people around me now, but I don't feel intimidated anymore. It's about time, don't you think? <laughs> and it's, it's, been, um, it's been rewarding because were it not for Monticello, were it not for the work at Monticello, then I wouldn't have this story to tell. My mentor at Monticello was a woman named Lucia Cinder Stanton. And she's written the seminal book about slavery at Monticello and enslaved people. She knows more about Jefferson and enslaved people than anyone else on earth. She's since retired. Um, she founded a program called, a co-founded, the Getting Word Oral History Project. She is a white woman. She founded it with a black woman whose name is, um, she's since passed away, Diane Swan Wright. And Getting Word is 28 years old now. They collected um, from the descendants of enslaved people in oral history, hundreds of enslaved people. They traveled thousands and thousands of miles, and they finally landed with me, or I finally landed with them. And um, they helped me uncover this history. It's short of having my son. It's the most important work I've done in my life. This is my second child. So yeah. Yeah, because one of the things you point out is that um, uh, during his lifetime, you know, Thomas Jefferson, you know, owned, quote unquote, over 600 people. Oh, he owned. Take those quotes out. Yeah, right. He owned people. Yeah, and yeah. and so, um, which is a mind-boggling yeah, huge is. number, and many of whom, or most of whom, were sold to pay debts That's when right. he died. Um, and so, I'm imagining our, I mean, people are maybe discovering, you know, coming uh, almost weekly, daily, monthly to say. I think I'm connected here too. Does that you know, are they, they still part? Are they still part of you know, the come, history? Yeah, they come off, and we still have the Getting Word Oral History Project. And I should clarify something: I'm descended from Thomas Jefferson and his wife. What we uncovered in doing the research is that we are um, related to Jefferson's great great grandson, one of his great great grandsons. His name was Moncure Robinson Taylor. And here's the thing. Among the artifacts that I was bequeathed um, by my uncle, the only survivor in my dad's family aside from my dad, was a Bible. From, it's dated 1821, and the initials on the Bible were DT. I never knew what they meant, 
until we uncovered this history with the help of Cindy Stanton and discovered that Jefferson had a, a, a great-great-grandson named Moncure Robinson Taylor. This is part of the detective work. T on the Bible that my uncle said was passed down from his grandmother, T for Taylor. So I'm descended from Jefferson and his wife. I'm his five times great-granddaughter. But we also discovered in the process, and this is when I started doing the happy dance, that we're descended from the Hemings family through a man named Peter, we mentioned earlier, Peter Hemings, who's Sally Hemings is three times, um, I mean, Sally Hemings is brother, he's my three times great grandfather. The thing is, the reason I said I did the happy dance is because when we found out we were related to Jefferson and his wife, I was really disappointed because I always thought I was related to Sally Hemings, I thought I was descended from her and didn't know when we finally uncovered that we, it was through Jefferson's great-great-grandson that we were Hemingses until we made that Peter Hemings discovery. So I'm really proud to be a descendant of the Hemings family. I just want to add this as well. We mentioned that Jefferson was my favorite um, president, and that's because he wrote the Declaration, and I'm still proud of the Declaration. And for a long time, I felt a sense of pride. This is how twisted racism can make you. Make you. I felt a sense of pride being descended from Jefferson, a man who owned people. I have very mixed feelings about the man now. He was not a man of his time. He was a man who knew it was immoral. He knew it was wrong. And he still did it because it gave him the lifestyle that was comfortable. Jefferson looked like a prince. He did. He lived really well to the very end of his life. So much so that he was to, in debt to the equivalent of maybe with inflation, it might be five million dollars by now. Hmm. His house had to be sold. His daughter, his only surviving daughter, who was my four times great grandmother, lived from pillar to post, as they say, moving from one child's home to another. The people he owned had to be sold the overwhelming majority of them, save a handful, including my three times great-grandfather. So I don't have the same warm, fuzzy feeling about Thomas Jefferson that I had a few years ago after I made these discoveries. And it wasn't just only people. He did a lot of things that were very offensive, of which he knew better. My father, a civil servant, left his children better off than Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, <laughs> did. That is a great statement. <laughs> it's true. The Hemings family, on the other hand, left us character, integrity, work ethics, good looks. <laughs> <laughs> so when I uncovered that, in fact, we are descendant from the Hemings family, I was really proud of that. And that's the focus I like to make now. And just for um, PBS fans out there, one of the things that you talk about is the finding your roots people kind of oh. helping. And um, you know, we're always so intrigued when it's on TV and Skip Gates sort of says, oh, and what did it make you feel about you know, some like, amazing discovery? So maybe just talk a little bit about kind of working you know, with those folks and um, you know, kind of you know, how they helped or. So this is a really long story. Um, and that I'll try to truncate as much as possible. Through an Ancestry DNA, which is great, it's a miracle of science, actually, I made a connection through a white cousin. Her name is Tess Taylor. I write a lot about Tess in this story. And Tess wrote a story in the New York, that was published in the New York Times. It was called Cousins Across the Colored Line. And Skip Gates, who incidentally is a friend of my husband's, picked up on the story. I don't think he saw my name in it, or I never put it together with Jack White. And they were in touch with Tess, and they offered to send us 23andMe and Ancestry DNA test. Let me back up, I mis um, misrepresented. Tess and I found each other through her writing. She's a poet. We found each other via the internet. And then she wrote a piece about how we met. And then Skip reached out to us. And, and she asked. kind of appropriated the story, too. She did appropriate anyway. the story. She did. That is, that's why I said this is a long story. She did. She's not speaking to me, I don't think, right now. But, I'm, but she's wonderful. To, she's the reason that all this has come together. So I'm really, Tess, if you're watching, I'm very appreciative for what you did. And Skip Gates reached out to us, 20, sent us 23andMe sets, 
and um, a step from Ancestry DNA. And um, my sister and I, my sister and I worked on, talked about this for years, about this relationship to Jefferson. My sister and I said, well, do we really want to take this test? Because we've got this oral history of Aunt Peachy. I should add that Aunt Peachy could not read, write, or even spell her own name, and was, um, had a proclivity for telling old wives' tales. Do we, are we really sure about this? And we agreed that no matter what happened, we were going to stick to our stories. It didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but we took the test. And we found more ties to Jefferson than, and the Randolph family than I think white descendants have. So thank you, Tess. And then, of course, through Ancestry DNA, I found my Hemings family. So once again, thank you, Tess. This is not a plug for Ancestry DNA, but thank you, Ancestry DNA mm -hmm. and 23 and Me. Okay. Yes. Um, I have a few more questions, but I wanted to first see if folks out in the audience had questions. Um, and feel free to, um, if we could hear it, otherwise we'll bring the mic over to you. Yes. So, yes. The short answer to that is yes. There is, um, there's some divisions among the white descendants about the Sally Hemings Jefferson descendants. There's a group called the Monticello Association, and that is for descendants of Jefferson and his wife, Martha Wales Skelton. And other descendants of Jefferson, the black descendants, have been excluded from that group. However, there have been, uh, there's another group called the Monticello Community, and that's where the descendants, the white descendants, who have been allies of the black descendants. And they have had reunions. And they're our cousins. And we communicate on a regular basis, many of us. And there's a bond among us. And then there are descendants of the Getting Word Oral History Project. And these are the black descendants, some of whom have been living as white, because they look white. And we gather for these huge reunions. We have one at Monticello in 2018. We have another one coming up on um, June 17th and 18th, the weekend of Juneteenth. We have a great big event happening at Monticello that weekend. I invite all of you to come. We'll be, um, it's called Ascendant, and it will be about the descendants of the enslaved community talking about what it means to us to have this history. And there'll be lots of celebrities there. I'm not kidding. There really will be <laughs> some famous people there. And um, it's going to be pretty wonderful and enlightening. So I encourage you to go to Monticello.org and learn more about that. So yes, there have been, we do have relationships. We do. I have a question. Um, recently in Montpelier, the family ah. has been um, yes. controversy about charity <laughs> on the board of directors. Yes. And I wondered what you thought of that and what might be next for Monticello in that regard. So I signed, here's what I thought of it. I thought it was horrific that Montpelier took one position where they were giving parity to the descendants. I don't know. Does everybody know this story? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to try not to make any mistakes on this one. I don't have my talking points with me, but I think it was last year, the Montpelier board, and Montpelier, you know, is the home of um, um, James, James Madison, Madison, who's the father of the Constitution, decided to give parity, and they fought for it. The descendants fought for it to descendants on the Board of Trustees. So there would be as many members from the descendant community or people that they chose to represent them as there would uh, people selected by other Board of Trustees members. There are various ways that you probably know that people become trustee members. And then a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, the president of Montpelier and the board announced that they were going to eliminate or reduce those seats to great outcry, not just from the descendants, but from the nation. They generated a lot of publicity and attention. And just a week ago, the board rescinded that decision. They have allowed, I hate to use that word allowed, the descendants demanded and won back those seats, and now they thank you. Yes, give that a, let's have a round of applause for that, because that's excellent. That's excellent. 
of renowned scholars. There's one journalist, um, Soledad O'Brien, on that board now. Um, they generated a petition with change.org, which I signed, and now I get information and requests for funding from change.org on a <laughs> basis. And Once I just they have hit you, the button, they have money. me, and I say, yeah, I'm all for that. Here, take my 10 bucks. Um, so good for them. The descendants stood up and demanded what is their birthright. As for Monticello, Monticello is doing excellent work toward telling an inclusive story. And we continue to make strides in that regard. We have two descendants on staff. I've been there for six years now. A descendant is now head of the Getting World Oral History Project. He's my cousin. We connected through ancestry DNA. He did not know that he was a Hemings descendant, so he's like my son. I'm very proud of him. And we have a third person who's also from Washington, D.C., who's on staff at Monticello. So we have a voice. And um, we are working with the Board of Trustees. We would like to have some representation on the board, and I'm sure that we will. So at this point, there's not on the governance, but it's sort of a work in progress is kind of what you're yes. saying. Okay. I do work there. Just always yeah. remember yeah, that. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions back there? When I was 13 well, can I, can years I, can old. I just, let me just repeat. The, did yeah. everyone hear the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, tell me if I'm paraphrasing this correctly. Um, whether this kind of there was some internal conflict that maybe was um, came from this process. Did it actually add to it, or did it help kind of resolve it? So, as a as a 13 year old, I didn't think I had internal conflict. This has been a lifelong journey for me. So the conflict came decades later, when I had to really come to face with who I am in the United States of America. I'm a black woman in the United States of America, with a six foot tall, brown skinned black man who talks too much. He's real smart. So I worry about him. I had to come to terms with being in a country where a lot of people don't like me because of how I look or where someone might hurt my tall, brown-skinned son because he talks too much because of the color of his skin. Or in my all-white neighborhood, I was telling Paula earlier, because of so much violence that has occurred, I live in an all-white neighborhood in Richmond, Virginia, because it's closest to my son's school, and I'm going to go for the best I can have. And quite frankly, the best I could have is in this all-white neighborhood. I hate, I hate it that it's that way, but in Richmond, that's how it is. I walk every day two to four miles. That's how I keep this girlish figure. And I carry with me a cell phone, which I keep in a black sleeve. And I notice lately, when I take my walk, that people are looking at my right hand where I carry my cell phone in a black sleeve. And I rem recall, I'm remembering of a young man who was shot in New York a few years ago because the cops thought what he had in his hand was a, um, a gun. It was his cell phone. So the internal conflicts were not part of my upbringing. They were not part of my youth. They're part of my life now because I know who I am in America. However, those conflicts have become empowering because I do know who I am in America. I'm prepared to deal with who I am in America. I am no longer living in an insulated world. I know how to protect myself. I know how to protect my feelings. I know how to protect my son. And I can have this open conversation. And I can talk about race. And I can feel, is, are you, officer, are you a, an officer? OK. Because one of the things I don't ever want to do is offend anybody. They're good cops, and they're bad cops. They're good white people, and they're bad white people. They're good black people. And they're good black people. 
<laughs> yes. I'm a fire chief. Ah, okay. Oh. All right. Woo-woo. Here in Montgomery County, we made up of 50% minority females, 50 female in our volunteer service, and 50 minority male in our volunteer service. So we work side by side law enforcement, and they look at me, and the first thing they see is, well, uniform, are you the police? And I have seen, I've been in this 43 years. I grew up in a mixed race family in Pittsburgh, and you don't know what my race is by looking at me. I'm losing sisters and brothers every day because they are not racist, but we are in an institutionally racist field. And I teach an academic for a profession. There's institutional racism. Healthcare, there's institutional racism. racism. Law enforcement and fire department, there is institutional racism throughout America. But they're not individuals who are racist, and we struggle with that. I lose people that when we in the field, we say, okay, I'm being really good. I'm not a racist. So how is the institution become racist? Where is it a right line? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for your work. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. I did not see institutional racism at all. I, I, I'm telling you, I've I lived in this magical world where I didn't want racism to exist and I didn't want sexism to exist. I had an afro when I was a kid because it was fashionable. So the world in which I live now, there, I see institutional racism wherever I go, in every place I go. I notice it. It's a burden. If you're black, you know what it's like to live like that. I didn't know what it was like before. And it was nice. The genie's out of the bottle. I can't go back, but I don't want to go back. I want this voice. And to answer your question, we need to continue having these conversations, and we need action. Talk is good. I like talk. That's great. But we need action. And we need action from our white allies. To, and we need to somehow get out of these silos, which is very, very difficult. We need to get out of these silos and talk with each other and hear each other and make change happen. We need to look at each other and see the human in us, the American in us. We're all Americans. I don't care what the color of your skin is. And we all need to share that with each other. And you don't need to, you can hear it. I, I like it that you hear from me. That's good. But whites need to stand up, too. That's how we move forward, by being allies in this fight. It's, it's, it's not this, it's really frightening. It's really discouraging. It's really painful to know that people going to a grocery store were shot down and killed good people because of the color of their skin. I can't read the headlines anymore. I'm a former journalist. I, it's depressing because of a replacement theory. Well, if we look back at American history, I think there's some American Indians who would like to address that. So we're, we're, we're all here. Some of us were here, were forced here. Some of us chose to come here. But we're all here from someplace else. So I hope that helps, answers a bit. And I think actually your book is a way to sort of have that, you know, it's one of many ways to have that conversation. So um, I thank you for writing it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other last questions in the audience? Uh-huh. I'm going to stand up because I have a bad back and I can't hear you that well. Maybe you can put the mic baby close to Thank you. I have gone down to Monticello uh, more than once. And it, it's been very interesting because the history that's given changes. 
it all depends on who's there that wants to share the information. I mean, the, mean the guide you. or yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Now, it is still puzzling. I'll be 84 in July. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's still puzzling to me that fear exists for many reasons. They're talking about the darkening of America mm -hmm. without realizing that a lot of Americans that perhaps are considered as being dark or African American are actually mixed race. If you go back in history, you will find that there is nothing new about there being mixed raced people that are referred to as black. There are many that are passing and have been passing for years as white. And it is so disingenuous to think that you are going to continue to sway a thought pattern one way or the other. And it all depends on who's speaking. And that's one of the things that I have been disenchanted about the many times that I've gone there. At first, Sally Hemings was never mentioned. I knew about her. I knew a little bit about the history. But who do you tell that will truly listen when you are telling them that you know the history it, that they're presenting is not correct. Well, first of all, thanks for coming to Monticello multiple times. We really appreciate that. And our guides are trained now to include certain specific information that they convey to our guests. And part of that information is that Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings had six children together, four of whom lived into adulthood. Um, we make it our goal to speak of not just Sally Hemings, but the others who were enslaved at Monticello, because it's not just about her anymore. It should really be about all those souls who gave up, were forced to give up so much. And we are working on a tour so that no one can come to Monticello anymore and not hear about enslavement there, and not hear who Jefferson was in its, his totality, as much as one can in a 40-minute tour, and not hear about the people who made his life possible. When you come to visit Monticello, if you get a chance to look at the building, you'll see children's fingerprints embedded in the bricks, because children made those bricks. Enslaved children made those bricks. And it's important for those stories to be told for the whole story to be shared. So if you come to Monticello and you don't hear that story, then please go to guest services, contact me at gjwhite at monticello.org. Make your voice heard. You have a voice. Okay. Good. Good. It was not. It was not. It, is, it has changed in the few years since I started visiting in Monticello. Sorry, say it again. I think that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with you. That's why I've been saying now that they don't want to have people come in. That's how the country begins. Right. What happened to everything in the middle of the Right. Yeah. Well, um, we're... 
Okay. All right. All right. We have uh, we have about two, we have two we have two minutes left. Well, this is a great And I want you guys to continue that conversation afterwards. I want to give Gail just the last word. If you have about ninety seconds left at this point, what do you wish maybe I or somebody else had asked you that you would like to leave us with oh, again today? These are great questions. I just want to thank all of you for your great great questions. Thank you for reading the book if you have already. Thank you for reading it because I hope that you intend to. Um, and I would encourage you, please, above all, to learn your own history, to talk to your children, to talk to your parents, to talk to your grandparents, your aunt and uncles, gather as much information as you can, and to please celebrate the people who have been written out of history. Recognize how much my people contributed. When I say my people, I mean my black people, and I say that with pride. You asked about the internal conflict. <coughs> About being black, I have no internal conflict, my brother. I am so proud of being black, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> I can't stop talking about being black. It's wonderful. It's a great place to be at this point in my life, and I hope I live another 30 years so I can keep talking, keep talking about it, and keep being proud, and keep standing strong. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here.